through this series we want to do these four things and perhaps more. Further understand some of the challenges we face in the world today. Know more clearly God's faithfulness and sovereignty in the midst of these challenges. Know what it means to be faithful to God's call on our lives. And know the specific blessings God has for those who are faithful in an age of compromise. Already we've been helped by Jesus' words to the churches in Ephesus, Smyrna and Pergamum. Today we're going to look at the letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Thyatira is here. I've tried to make this bigger, alright? Mm-hmm. Does anybody have the microphone? The, the, the glass thing? So Thyatira is here, around this area here. Um, the name of that city now is Akasa. Say that after me. Akasa. Akasa. Um, a city in Turkey at the moment. I want to say from the outset that things may get a little uncomfortable for us today. It is the fault of those people I sent the text to. <laughs> it's true. I was praying that they would be able to spill this whole sermon time up mm-hmm. and so I wouldn't have to preach this uncomfortable message. So it's their fault. Mm-hmm. Okay. Who got the tickets? <laughs> <laughs> now, during the first century, Thyatira was a centre for trades, for manufacturing, really. And you know, in some in some ways, my heart goes out to them. You know, they're they're the ugly city out of these seven cities. They are the the, the least prominent city. They have the smallest city. They have this long message to the smallest city. (laughs) And I feel like they're the Wyala of the seven churches. They're the Wyala. That's just what I feel. I don't think that's God saying, you are like, no. It's just this this thing. Bob, my commentator, remember Bob from last week? Well, last time Bob, my commentator, he said this, the longest and most difficult of the seven letters is addressed to the least known, least important and least remarkable of the cities. And that's how perhaps how Wyala feels about herself. The least known, the least important, least remarkable. Manufacturing at Thyatira was broad from its cloth dyeing facilities. We might remember Lydia, that trader in purple cloth from Philippi. Slave traders, bronze workers, all in the mix there at Thyatira. Trade guilds or associations were necessary for a person to get ahead both financially and socially. I wonder what it was like in Wyala in like the 70s if you didn't belong to a union Mm. in Wyala. I wonder if you could have got a job here Mm. in the steelworks and building ships. Same sort of thing. Same thing for them at Thyatira. But the guilds in Thyatira were intertwined with the religions of the region, which meant being present at at their meetings. I don't know if it was the same for meetings of trade unions, but Mm. sacrifices to idols, immoral practices were unavoidable if you wanted to succeed. Uh, This man made the guilds sort of opposed to the Christian faith, because membership to the guild would mean participation in idol worship and its associated sacrifices and other things. Though while there were a lot of gods in Thyatira, the chief god of the city was Tyrimnos, who was identified with Apollo, the Greek sun god, and the son of Zeus. It was believed Tyrimnos was worshipped as the son of God. Sort of sets it against Jesus. So, to the text, Revelation 2, verses 18 to 29. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, yeah, the Son son of God, the real one, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, 
and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now to the rest of you in Thyatira, I've gone too fast, too quick. The rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to the teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for our time together already this morning. I want to thank you for the ways in which you tie things together. I want to thank you for who you are. Pray that you would open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds. Help us to hear what your Spirit is saying to us. And Father, if that's part of the words which I share this morning, that's a great thing. Father, if it's not part of the words I'm sharing this morning, it's a great thing. Let us hear you and what you say. Soften our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thyatira. Jesus knows what they do. He knows their works, their love and faith, their service. He knows their perseverance. They are the sort of works any church would want to be known for. In fact, they were doing more then than they did at the beginning. We might remember the... Uh, the letter to the Ephesians, yeah? The Ephesians, go back to your first love. Go back. Go back. Well, Thyatira didn't have to go back. They had exceeded what they did at first. There's no doubt that the church in Thyatira excelled in their acts of love. They're not like the church in Ephesus. They have not forgotten their first love. They were an exciting congregation. There is no doubt that in our world, this church would be a leader and influencer of other churches. A trendsetter that writes books and worship music. Yet of all the churches we've met so far in this series, Thyatira is perhaps the easiest to understand, the easiest to see a connection with our world. And this is not a comment on the language of the images Jesus uses, because they can be difficult, but because we can clearly see what the issues are. And today's not much of a teaching message, I'm afraid. There's much more of a preaching one. See, there's this person, stylized as a Jezebel, who by her teaching is leading people in the church into spiritual and physical immorality. We get an understanding of this woman in Thyatira through the Old Testament story of Jezebel. In the Old Testament, Jezebel works tirelessly to promote unfaithfulness to Yahweh. She encouraged the worship of Baal and his companion, Ashtaroth. They were generic 
God names for fertility cults throughout the region. And along with those things came associated idolatry and immorality. Her story is found littered throughout 1 Kings 16, 19, 21, and then 2 Kings chapter 9. If you get bored today, you can read them. Just like the Old Testament Jezebel, this Jezebel encourages God's people, now called the church, into spirit, to commit spiritual adultery. That is, idolatry. And in doing so, commit sexual immorality. I knew. I knew that I did this mm -hmm. when I created the PowerPoint, that I actually removed one. And I couldn't remember where it was. Now it is. There was another dot point in there. I want you to note clearly, though, that what Jezebel does, what she's condemned for, is not because she leads the world into idolatry and immorality. It's not condemned for that at all. That's not something that Jesus addresses at all. But the fact that she leads the church into this. Christians into sexual sin and sexual immorality. And that's the second issue. The first issue is that she, that what she's doing for herself and where she is leading into this. The second issue is that her teaching and her practices are not condemned by the church. The church tolerates her. The church tolerates what she's teaching and what she encourages others to practice. And what we want to do this morning is we want to hone in on why these things were. Why were these things happening in Thyatira and then apply how that might be applied in our world today. And we do that by seeing the first issue is dependent on the second. She wouldn't be leading anyone astray if her teaching was not tolerated. Key to all of this is this one word. One word. Tolerance. Tolerance is a dangerous word to talk about in a room full of engineers. Mm -hmm. Tolerance has different meanings in different applications and how we use that word in today's society is changing. Miriam Webster Online Dictionary gives different domains for, uh, for the meaning of this word. But in addition to other things, tolerance is sympathy or indulgence for beliefs or practices differing from or conflicting with one's own. That's tolerance. Dictionary definition of tolerance. Within this sense, while it is okay to believe lots of different things and even change them over the course of time, one cannot, if one wants to remain tolerant, coerce or force another person to change what they believe, regardless of how horrible those beliefs might be. That's what tolerance means. So when people call to be tolerant, that's what the word means. That does not mean, however, that you have to change what you believe to include what others do or think. Or even that you even need to think positively about them. You can still discriminate and judge between right and wrong according to what you believe. You still do that and be tolerant. There is, however, in our time, the meaning of tolerance is shifted. Not so much by definition, but by application. The practice of tolerance is becoming what the authors of the International Bureau for Children's Rights term open-mindedness. I've searched far and wide for material here. <laughs> tolerance seems to be evolving into something that was never meant to be. Tolerance was never meant to say that you cannot believe that something is absolutely true 
only that you need to respect people who do not think that way. Tolerance was never meant to say that all values and practices are equal. Because to say that makes Mother Teresa morally e equal to a murderer and Jack the Ripper the moral equivalent of a saint. Tolerance was never meant to say that you cannot discriminate between what you think is right and wrong, only that you cannot expect or make others discriminate in the same way you do. To condemn a person's right to believe in an absolute being who has absolute morality, justice and goodness, who will judge people at a time that he has set and who has offered just one way to salvation, which includes rescue from his judgment, is by definition open-mindedness, not tolerance. But it has become by practice both tolerance and open-mindedness. So when we practice our beliefs by being a person who has found that faith in Christ is the only way to freedom from sin and death, that he is the only way to eternal life, we are condemned as intolerant because we disagree with any other means of attaining such blessings by anybody else, we are condemned as being intolerant because we are not open-minded. But that is not where we find ourselves in science here. Often when we talk about intolerance and we, we rail against this word that we need to be tolerant, we're railing against open-mindedness, not against the fact that other people have the right to believe what they want. We're glad to live in a country that's like that, aren't we? Are we glad that actually in Australia you can be wrong? <laughs> and not con Otherwise, let's just go, let's all just move to Afghanistan. <laughs> Shall we? Let's just all just move there, or perhaps we'll move the Taliban here. And then we'll know what, it's, what intolerance is like. Our issue is not intolerance. Our issue is open-mindedness. But the issue in Thyatira was tolerance. The church was tolerating the self-styled prophet's teaching which allowed followers of Jesus to engage in sexual immorality and spiritual adultery. It would be unlikely, however, that she stood in front of the church and said that outright. I think it would be unlikely. <laughs> there would be a reason, a philosophy, a hook that drew people from faithfulness in, to Jesus to compromise. And we must remember that the people of Thyatira or any church at that age uh, did not have a New Testament to read wherever they went. They did not have a pocket New Testament. You can imagine them running around the uh, Asia Minor with a cart. They need a cart for all the scrolls. They have to carry them along with them. They didn't have a Bible wherever they went. Access to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were limited. To a person's ability to speak and persuade, their skills in philosophy, reason, their knowledge of spiritual things could carry an argument in their favour. So if a person could persuade their hearers that what happens in the flesh, in their body, as to what they eat or drink or whatever, does not really matter... For the flesh just rots in the grave or is burned with fire, there's no real spiritual or eternal value. If they could do that, if they could tell them that what happens in the flesh doesn't matter, then going to a trade guild meeting where they sacrifice animals to various gods, then cook them and eat them, does not matter either. It's only the flesh. Anyway, and if there's some loose and casual sex happening associated with the worship of these gods in the form of cult prostitutes or whatever, that doesn't matter. It's only a flesh thing. The flesh won't make it into the next life. In fact, because your livelihood depended on being able to be part of a trade guild, then being free to participate in the goings-on at the guild meetings 
was essential for you and your family. It's not as if you have to actually offer the sacrifices yourself. You know, that may have been a sneaky thought too. That if you go to these festivities, then you have an opportunity to share the gospel with people. <laughs> and that thought might have been joined by another. Any true worship of any deity is actually worship of our God. If it's from the heart. And that thought might have been considered a deep teaching. A mystery. Now revealed by a prophet. A secret to unlocking kingdom fruitfulness. Now despite this sort of behaviour being opposed in the scriptures, despite it being contrary to Bible precepts and the very notion of God's holiness, despite it being things that God sent his prophet Elijah to prophesy against, it is tolerated amongst the people of God. Not everyone is doing what this Jezebel teaches. Not everyone tolerates her particular heresy. But she is still allowed to teach it in the churches of Thyatira. She is able to gather Followers like the Jezebel of old. So the issue is twofold. On the one hand, we, this Jezebel gets to speak in the church, while on the other, people, followers of Jesus, follow her teaching. And so we have Jesus and her children addressed by Jesus. Tolerance. It's a catch cry, isn't it, of Western civilization, civilization in the 21st century, catch cry. tolerance. I see it sometimes, you go to visit a school and it's one of the values in the school, tolerance. It's no surprise that, um, that there's that document, this international document to do with children that talks a lot about tolerance. What its application has come to do more with open-mindedness, tolerance has become a stick with which to beat anything that will upset the growing infatuation and complete with growing infatu infatuation with complete equality that disowns any difference, discernment or discrimination. And so on the back of an equally strong push to on the one hand recover relevance with the church, while on the other reduce offence to the world, we, the, the current expression of the universal church, have entertained stuff we never would have a hundred years ago. Stuff that happens in the church now would never have happened a hundred years ago. Have we entertained our own Jezebels? The Baptists in this state tolerate our own self-styled prophets. Yes and no. Our teaching is not declared that it's okay to worship other so-called gods or that it's okay to sleep with anything you want to. But we don't often talk about moral issues either or declare the sovereignty and holiness of a God who will judge people for their sins. It's probably where we're at. Not just as Baptists, but the church. But I can only speak about Baptists, really, can I? Now, this might come as a, as a surprise, but I think we have compromised in the same sort of way as the church of Thyatira compromised. And the way we've done that is that we tolerate a different gospel than the one that was preached by the apostles, by Paul and Peter and John and the early church. We preach a different gospel that was proclaimed in the Reformation and the Great Awakenings in England and America in the 18th and 19th century. We tolerate a different gospel than that which was at the heart of the movements of God that have sprung up in this nation from time to time and place to place. We've compromised the gospel in a few ways and none of them Technical. People never compromise by accident. 
We do not compromise the gospel because we did not know it, but we have compromised precisely because we did. Not because we don't know. We compromise because of what we do. We're so afraid to say to people, if you do not trust Jesus, you will spend an eternity without him. We don't want to say that. We're so afraid to say to our friends, our family, our Facebook community that sin is wickedness and evil and that those who continue to base their lives in it are no friends of God, but rather they despise Him. We're scared to say that they will be judged by Him and found to be wanting. Their lives will not be written in the book because they do not trust in Jesus for their salvation. But we are not afraid to declare to all and sundry that they are worthy. And that God loves them so that he sent Jesus to free us from the slavery that Satan bound us in. We're not afraid to share that with them. But we are afraid though to declare to those same folk that they chose that slavery. In defiance of a holy God. And that Jesus' sacrifice also paid for our full-on rebellion so that it was his life for ours. <clears throat> we don't want to say that. I think sometimes we tolerate a different gospel. I think that sometimes our gospel says we can simply choose Jesus and that he did not need to die for us. Rather, if we do some stuff under the banner of justice and mercy, then the people who receive the stuff under that banner will make it into the kingdom of God. Everything will be okay. Even if Jesus dying for them means nothing to them. I think sometimes our gospel is different than the one the early church proclaimed. The one that we find in the pages of Acts, and Romans, and the rest of the New Testament. It's different because it's not really good news because we do not really need to change. It's different because it doesn't need God to move in sovereign ways to save us. It's not a miracle when someone is saved in our Gospel. It's not a miracle when God's wrath against sin is averted. When someone is born again into the kingdom of God, all they've done is choose and now they identify as a follower of Jesus. It's not the result of a sovereign act of God when someone moves closer to him. When anyone says in their heart that they need to get right with him, that gospel says that's not a move of God. That's just a choice they're making. When I read the Bible, the Bible says it's a move of God. The Bible says that no one wants to seek after God. No one, not one. And the fact that we all sit here and we worship him today is a sovereign act of God. A miracle has happened in our lives. A miracle. tolerate, I think, different Gospels. I think this is true because we do not pray. Our eyes are dry when we think about the lost. We're not desperate for God to act to save our neighbour and our colleagues because we don't think he acted to save our brother, our sister, our husband, our wife, our mum, our dad, our son, our daughter. Prayer that the gospel might be proclaimed and displayed as it ought is less important than entertainment, than games, parties, or even coffee. And I know that some people can't make prayer times because of other commitments, but the few do not cover the multitude. We tolerate a gospel that doesn't hate sin, that doesn't need God, that has Jesus of our own making cobbled together from selected readings of Jesus' life. We 
tolerate a different gospel because we're ashamed to have the history of the one who died for us, naked on a tree, to pay for our sins, to take the just judgment against us. We are ashamed to have that history so that we might have life. We just want the life. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I know we tolerate a different gospel because we're not urgent about God's gospel. I know we're not urgent because we spend more time worrying about wearing masks in the community. More time discussing what all that means. More time judging the actions of governments to control either the virus or control people than we do pouring out our hearts before God that he might send his Holy Spirit to convict again this world and again his church of sin righteousness and judgment. Jesus, the Son of God, who has eyes like fire and is steadfast and powerful with feet like burnished bronze, says, repent. And he says repent because he is the one who searches our hearts, our minds, and who will repay each one according to their deeds. <coughs> I'm going to pray. And I need God to work in me. But one of us will say we've ever compromised the gospel. But we need God to work in us. Seriously. Seriously. God's Spirit to start that work in us. I want to pray. Um, I don't know what you're going to do in your hearts, but I'm going to bow my knee before Him. I pray that He will once again amaze me. That He will come and fill this temple. He'll come and fill us with His presence. That we might. Holy Spirit, I need you. Completely and utterly dependent on you. You know me through and through. You know the times when I've let you down, when I've, I've compromised your gospel, when I've not said the truth, when I've not relied upon you. But even more, you know the coldness of my prayers, the hardness of my heart. You know my eyes are dry when I pray for the lost. You know how infrequently I do. Holy Spirit, I need you. Unless you fill me, unless you empower me, unless you cause my face to look at Jesus, Unless you're the one, then I, I don't know. Go around the mountain again. Holy Spirit, help me to live as one who has been crucified with Christ. I know the power of the cross in my life. you exerted when you run.